Good afternoon. You're listening to Clearing the Air on KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM. I'm your host, Dolores Weller from the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, also known as CVAC. And Clearing the Air, our program covers air pollution issues in the San Joaquin Valley and brings you interviews with individuals who are at the forefront of air pollution policy, advocacy, and research. And our show airs every fourth Friday at 3 p.m. and is hosted by a CVAC staff member. And CVAC is basically a partnership of more than 70 member organizations throughout the Valley and state unified in their commitment to creating clean air here in the San Joaquin Valley. And today we're talking about some Fresno specific research um, and on the impacts of air pollution, uh, specifically transit exposures during pregnancy from the Center uh, on Children's Health and Air Pollution Study of San Joaquin Valley. And so uh, many times I've, I've brought uh, research to the radio station, um, research that's done at Harvard, um, you know, research, international research that relates to the San Joaquin Valley, but I'm very excited to, to share with listeners uh, research that's being done here in the Valley about the impacts of air pollution in the Valley. So today to have that discussion, we have um, our guest, Dr. Kara Zagrafos and Dr. Jamin Kwan. Um, Dr. Uh, Zagrafos earned her doctorate in public health from Loma Linda University. Um, she is a, the director of the Master of Public Health program and teaches at the undergraduate and graduate levels of the Department of Public Health at Fresno State. And uh, her research includes asthma, air quality, and the impacts of religion on health outcomes. And also with us, Dr. Jamin Kwan, who um, earned his Ph.D. at um, uh, Rutgers University. He's the Assistant Professor of Environmental Health in the Department of Public Health at Fresno State. And um, his research is focused on assessing environmental exposure to air pollutants, um, urban residential area, areas, and also current um, uh, research on exploring the association of persons' time location data on in re- real-time monitoring of exposure to air pollution. So thank you both for joining us here on the show to talk about uh, a very specific uh, project that you've, you've developed. Thank you for inviting us. So to start off, please tell us about, share with us about what the research um, center does and how long it's existed here in the Valley. I think a lot of our listeners are unaware of the Children's Health and Air Pollution Study and that there is a, a center existing here in the Valley. And so if you can give us just an overview of, of what, what they, they do. So the Children's Health and Air Pollution Study um, started in the 90s and we're kind of um, continuing with some of that research looking at um, transit exposure to these air pollutants and how neighborhood characteristics affect transit exposure. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the researchers from the University of California in Berkeley studied uh, the children's who has asthma in the Fresno area ever since 1998 or 1999. The study called FACES, Fresno Asthmatic Children's Study. So the CHAPS is quite a new name for the current center name, but the researchers has been looking at the asthma and air pollution associations ever since the 90s. Because of them, they actually continuously measured the air pollution levels uh, in a real time for more than 15 years. So they have been achieved a lot of the f- new findings that's related to air pollution and health outcomes, mm-hmm. such as asthma and birth uh, defects and preterm birth. And recently we are moving on to like uh, obesity and glucose dysregulation which may be associated with air pollution, mm-hmm. which is surprising, right? So have you thought about the diabetes can be associated with, triggered by air pollution? I've, I think I've heard some links of you yeah. know, research widely, but I haven't mm-hmm. heard of it specifically here in the Valley. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and also the one of the our main studies, Atopic Mechanisms study, which is done by the Stanford Medical School, the pediatrician, she actually measured 
the regulatory T cell, which is an immune function, uh-huh. and she found that the more suppressed genes in certain samples, which all came from Fresno area. Mm-hmm. So Fresno asthmatic children has more suppressed immune function compared to the asthmatic children in the San Jose area. Mm-hmm. And even for the healthy children in Fresno has also had a suppressed immune function mm-hmm. compared to the other areas. Right. So that's how she found that the exposure is actually impacting on DNA mm-hmm. of people, which we can call the epigenetic problems. Mm-hmm. Right, and I think that particular research we do have on our, our website, calcleanair.org, um, I think it's really important to, to acknowledge. Um, uh, CVAC is a part of the advisory board group for um, the center, and um, I remember reviewing that information. And like you said, the immune systems of ch- healthy children in Fresno were lower than those of um, asthmatic children in other yeah. areas. Okay. That was really surprising. Yeah. That's how we got funded from the uh-huh. NIEHS, National Institute of in- Environmental Health Science, and also the United States EPA, uh-huh. Environmental Protection Agency. So this is like a multiple uh, institutional uh, study, which the UC Berkeley School of Public Health involves, and then St- um, Stanford Pediatrician Medical School involved in UC San Francisco, Fresno, and Fresno State is honored to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely a lot of hands working together. And for this particular research that we're talking about today, that is um, transit exposure uh, during pregnancy, does that involve all of the the different partners that you mentioned, Berkeley, Stanford, or is this specific to certain um, universities? Project 4 is um, with Fresno State and UC Berkeley, Okay, those two partners. Okay, and can you tell me about the, the specific project, just kind of an overview? Yeah, I can tell you about the neighborhood characterization part, mm-hmm. um, which I'm involving my students in, my undergraduate students. Mm-hmm. And we created a structured social observation tool mm-hmm. where students um, work in a group, usually three to four students at a time, and they go into the neighborhood, mm-hmm. and they basically are looking for assets the positive things in a neighborhood, such mm-hmm. as um, clearly marked streets, um, green space to play, mm-hmm. um, safe you know areas in which they can play in, and then also some of the liabilities or the negative things in neighborhoods, such as um, you know syringes, condoms on streets, mm-hmm. graffiti, um, empty lots that aren't well maintained, things that are kind of at risk in neighborhoods. sources. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then they're tracking these things Mm -hmm. during their walks. And we've done this for about three or four semesters now where we're we're going in different neighborhoods and doing neighborhood characterization because the idea is that based on those characterizations, people are, you know, commuting differently. Their transit exposure is different based Mm -hmm. on that. Right. And are you partnering with any community-based organizations in that research, or is it solely within the, the university and, and the students? For me, it's just um, involving my students in that at okay. the university level. Great. And why? Why? Um, what was the need sort of behind the, you know, pursuing this study? Was there a particular thing, maybe a previous research project that kind of, you know, expressed a need for doing this? Or what was the interest in developing this project? And I think the air pollution is the kind of a regional mm-hmm. problem. But sometimes the, we are looking at the spatial and temporal variation, which means depends on where you are and what time of the day. Uh, it, air pollution changes a lot, mm-hmm. right? So, for example, think about the, you are in the terminal, a bus terminal, or bus stop in the morning rush hour, Obviously, you see more traffic goes by, and your exposure may be quite different than when there's not much traffic there. Mm -hmm. And also, let's say you are riding a car, and when and then you see the 18 wheelers which gunk out those like black smoke from this exhaust pipe. I mean, you can smell that, right? Right. Which means like uh, time location information is really important, and we want to know that uh, how the 
overall, it's not easy to estimate or measuring everybody's time, location, and exposure. Mm-hmm. So we are trying to capture the, what's the basic general uh, population in Fresno area, specifically for the pregnant woman population, and then to propose the model that can estimate the exposure during their pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And then we are following up. We are not we, but I mean our mm-hmm. co- collaborators in Stanford will follow up from mom to when the, the, the baby is born and the baby is one year old mm-hmm. and two year old. So it's like uh, piece wisely, we are actually tracking them and follow them to see how DNA changes mm-hmm. is associated with the exposure. So we keep uh, measuring the exposure and t- improving the model to provide each individual pregnant woman participant exposure and their baby's health outcome. Mm-hmm. And so this piece of the research is, is sort of kind of the, the landscape for what Stanford will be doing? Yes, okay. our data will be used to construct those models. Mm-hmm. And also the UC Berkeley group, which is called the Exposure Core, has been done a lot of research in this area and keep monitoring continuously. And we did finish the spatial saturation sampling, which is called, we put those like 50 different locations in Fresno area. We put those samplers and then measuring those different air pollutant species Mm -hmm. at the same time for four weeks during the last winter. So we did one week in November and one week in December one week, another week in January and February. So winter is well known for the bad air pollution day, mm-hmm. especially for particulate matter, which is smaller than 2.5 micrometers in its diameter. And that contains a lot of part of the black smoke mm-hmm. and PAHs and all the uh, carcinogenic mm-hmm. effect, carcinogens in there. So the what we found is like uh, when trying to capture that if you are closer to the highways, especially for the when there's like a more diesel traffic goes by, mm-hmm. and are there, could we observe the higher elevated concentrations there? And if a pregnant woman lives nearby those roadways, the exposure may be higher mm-hmm. than someone who's living further away. Right. <laughs> and so you you were actually setting up monitors in those different locations right. and monitors in addition to the existing monitors that right. ERB and the we Air have, District uses? We have four existing monitors which is continuously measuring. Mm-hmm. And then in addition to that, to capture the special variation, we did the saturation sampling last winter. Mm-hmm. So so my uh, federal states, uh, my study is actually measuring those are walking and walking route those neighborhood with those monitors with my students right. and Kara's students mm-hmm. so the point is I mean we can actually gather some information that such as when you walking in your neighborhood what's your exposure would look like mm-hmm. and then uh, furthermore with that short term exposure measurement can that give any clue to show any differences between those neighborhoods. Right. Which, mm-hmm. Yeah, and could you talk about some of the different zip codes, maybe sure. some of the areas in Fresno that you've, you've focused on or that kind of stood out in, in your information gathering? So we try to select about three or four zip codes each semester. Mm-hmm. And then within those zip codes, depending on their size, we create three to four routes. Mm-hmm. We basically start in the center of the zip code and we try to pick a good representation of that zip code and then we create maps for the students to walk you know and do their social Mm -hmm. observation and then after my students do the neighborhood characterization piece that's when j students come out and do the air 
monitoring piece so that we can, you know, keep the two together. Okay. And so this is sort of a a work in progress uh, at the moment, but what are some of the observations that you found? Are there certain areas in Fresno that, you know, seem like, you know, areas to focus on further or that stand out? I know there was something in the the report about walkability scores, all the different factors that you used. We've calculated, um, well, we've done two things. The first is the primary data, which is what my students are collecting. Mm -hmm. And what we've done mostly now, because it's still initial in stages, is we've looked to see how reliable our um, measurements are Mm -hmm. by using the group of students and having them go out together, making sure that they're charting things the same way. So, for example, if one student marks down that there's graffiti or lack of um, green space for um, kids to play, Mm -hmm. that that's being marked equally among all of our groups Mm -hmm. so that we can make sure the measurement's actually accurate and and reliable in that sense. And so that's part of the part we're doing now, but we haven't actually analyzed yet which neighborhoods are, um, you know, more risky, let's say, than Mm -hmm. others. We haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. And what's what's sort of the timeline for this project? When do you think you feel like you'd, you'd be at that point to to sort of make an assessment? Probably we're going to analyze some of the data this semester, um, but we are going to be doing all 20 zip codes. That's our goal. So we're trying to do about four zip codes per semester, Mm -hmm. and by the time we're done with data collection, we will have all 20. Great, great. Um, and so how does this all connect with um, pregnancy? Because I know that's that's within the, the sort of the title of the project. So can you talk about how you're, you're trying to make the connection to, to pregnancy and pregnant mothers? Yeah, based on the uh, walking route, real-time air monitoring data, and what we found is the indoor level of those the pollution was very significantly lower than outdoor concentration. So the when we gather we are collecting the moms and party participant paying moms mm-hmm. the time location information for about like four four days to two weeks and then we wanna like a uh, look at the pattern of their if they if the mom is working and if mom is not working, and we can actually separate them based on their gr- different groups. So these are moms that volunteer to provide moms information to the in center. In this study, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we we are looking at the more than 200 moms mm-hmm. there. So we know that the the date and time and their location information, mm-hmm. and we don't want them to carry all those the heavy devices. Mm-hmm. So we will try to simulate that. So such as driving 99 for several days and gathering those information. And if we can say some kind of average concentration of exposure. Mm -hmm. And we can compare that with riding a bus in the, in a Fresno area and riding, and we will collect those data and try to fit in to provide the more accurate the estimate of those moms Mm -hmm. exposure during their pregnancy. Right, and so then you would overlap that information from right. uh, Dr. Zagrafo's information yeah. as far as the zip codes and also the uh, what we are looking at is like is the neighborhood walkability and the social infrastructure is it really impacting the choice of moms mm-hmm. uh, choice of transit method mm-hmm. such as if it's not safe to walk outside, I mean people may tend to want to get a car mm-hmm. rather than uh, using the transportation, public transportation. Because right. some of the neighborhoods that we have um, looked at, mm-hmm. the bus stops are not conveniently located mm-hmm. to where they're living, and so it may not be realistic for them to be able to walk. Um, and when they are walking, they're being exposed too, so we're trying to look at those characterizations that mm-hmm. dictate some of that behavior, Sure, that transit behavior. Definitely. Um, do you feel like, you know, this is kind of in the, the initial your sort of assessment stage and you haven't, you know, published the, the research project. Do you feel like this is going to bring out some further questions, maybe some new research that you think merits some more attention to a specific issue um, beyond this specific transit and pregnancy project? Is there something that kind of sparks your curiosity out of, out of this project? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, maybe it's a little too early to talk mm-hmm. about the renewing this program, but uh, we really want to renew the pro- 
program because it has been like 15 years mm -hmm. and we want to have another five years so that it can reach to 20 years. Mm -hmm. However, at this point, it's a little too early to talk about, but our data collection and collective data will provide a lot of rich information mm -hmm. to our collaborators so that uh, our next step is actually the more research publications mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. So, so so far I didn't really see. I collected um, ten, I mean twenty route samples for twice, which is like a forty route sample, because everything was every route has been repeated, mm -hmm. and then. Based on the preliminary data analysis, the spatial variation was smaller than temporal variation, which means the wind, when the wind blows and it just brings everything away. Mm -hmm. When it's, there's a fog, then by, so local meteorological uh, con conditions and also the how close you are to the immediate sources mm -hmm. may be more matter than the regional Measurement. Sure. So, so far we could find that if you are right next to the buses or trucks and your exposure might be higher. And if you encounter a smoker while you're walking, that's also another source right. of exposure. Mm -hmm, that you don't necessarily account for. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, and if you're just joining us now, um, you're listening to KFCF 88.1 FM. Uh, this is Clearing the Air. Your host, Laura Sweller, and uh, we're talking to uh, Dr. Zagrafos and Dr. Kwan uh, from Fresno State about uh, some Fresno-specific research on air pollution. And uh, some of the information that you've, you've been sharing with me just reminds me uh, maybe a good opportunity to share with um, listeners is that our local air district has been um, interested in doing some modeling. Um, and so instead of... Um, putting new monitors up throughout the valley, um, creating their own modeling center. So they'll be able to, you know, determine what your air quality is uh, wherever you, you are. And so um, obviously that, I think, needs a lot, of, a lot of different hands and, you know, eyes to review that information to make sure a lot of these different factors are, are being considered. And I know it's in just in its development stage now, and uh, I think they're using a lot of historical data with the goal of um, having a real-time system where they'll be able to determine what your air quality is without necessarily having to monitor near you. Um, but as you explained, there are so many different factors of, you know, uh, land use and how the land use is changing constantly and, and the different zip codes and exposure. So um, I hope that um, your eyes and, and other, you know, uh, from your partners will, will be involved in that, that process to, to develop that tool as it's, as it's happening at the, the Air District. Um, and, and lastly, I just wanted to, to hear from you um, how you, you think this research, you know, in, you know in, in, at the end of the, the year as you're finalizing, the, you know, your, your research, how do you think this would be useful to the public, maybe to a community-based organization, um, certain policy, on a policy level? How do you feel this, where this research should be shared and how it should be used? Uh, we've um, already started sharing the research and okay. we've presented at um, international, national conferences, even some things locally at Fresno State. And I think okay. one of the benefits that, that I have felt um, from this study is the involvement of my students mm -hmm. in the research. Because um, often in class I will tell them the importance of engaging in research and we talk about it in the class. But it's been a great opportunity to let them collect the data mm -hmm. and then as a result they've developed programs um, kind of like a program plan that they create based on the information that they've collected in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to see that connection between what we do in class and research. And, and that's been, for me, one of the most um, significant benefits that I have felt as their, you know, professor. Great. And also, yeah, I'm using this as to bring this research to my classroom so that my students can learn hands-on experience of how to collect those real-time monitoring data. And also, the um, we have been the CHEPS researchers actually helped the uh, Center for Advanced Research and Technology in the CART 
which is the high school science program in Fresno and Clovis Unified School District. Mm -hmm. So the students has some kind of experience to, to collect the real-time monitoring data when they are commuting using those school buses or mm -hmm. other. So I think that that's really contributing to the community. Mm -hmm. And one good news is like uh, since we have been watching over the Fresno for more than 15 years, right? Right. The trend of air pollution is reducing. So we are not as like before. The air pollution is air quality is improving. Mm -hmm. That really is the pol the research findings actually forced to make the new policy on those all the hard regulation of those diesels and also the traffic and the all I mean the, the mobile sources and industry sources so that's actually working so right for ozone maybe and I know particulate matter might be a little mm -hmm. different um, mm -hmm. I know with the American Lung Association's research they showed that ozone has seen uh, quite a bit of improvement but PM 2.5 we're still seeing a lot mm -hmm. of high peaks Right. In our winter time pollution. And, and PM 2.5 is actually the, any particle based on its aerodynamic size. Mm -hmm. When the particle size, the diameter is like less than 2.5 micrometers, it's considered as the PM 2.5. It can be anything. It can be, it can be liquid, it can be solid, mm -hmm. it can be mixture, and it can be it can contain a lot of the elements like sulfates or nitrates. And it's not the why we are more worried of PM 2.5 is the smaller the particle is, it can have to lodge into the lung and it can be readily observed. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at not just PM 2.5, but we are being more specific in those black carbons or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And what makes up the PM 2.5. Right. Okay. It's, it's a component mm -hmm. of PM 2.5. But the toxicity depends on the different element mm -hmm. is quite different. Right. So we want to, so we are actually looking at the more like microscopically, mm -hmm. and then those are in included in PM 2.5, but often found in the much smaller particle, mm -hmm. like PM 0 0.1, which sure. is 10, I mean 100 nanometers mm -hmm. or smaller which is more readily observed right. our, to, your, to our body when we are exposed to. Right. And so we're running, running out of time, but I just wanted to say lastly that I can think of a million places where this research can be used, just, you know, working with a lot of community-based organizations here in Fresno and, you know, groups that are working on the Fresno General Plan and, you know, trying to look at specific communities and addressing the issues that they face. So um, looking forward to, to seeing the end product and um, would love to share that with, with our partners. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zografos and, and Dr. Kwan, for joining us. Um, you've been listening to KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM. This is Clearing the Air, and we'll hear from you next month.